Hello and welcome to Produced By. Just quickly before we begin, if you enjoy the show, please consider supporting it by joining our Patreon. You can choose from a list of memberships and will receive some exciting rewards. Thank you and back to the episode. Can you tell us more then about your freelancing journey that you've been continuing since uh, you left from there? Yeah, so I can catch up on like when I left ILP, I I felt like a bit lost because this was the really cool company that I really enjoyed working at for the first like six months, mm-hmm. and I learned so much. But then I started to struggle, and like by the end of the year. I I was really depressed and I didn't realize it until my girlfriend like I one day I couldn't actually get out of bed mm-hmm. because it just felt so meaningless to go work on some stupid Hollywood show and like <laughs> I should go save the world instead. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and my girlfriend she sent me some links to like this is what depression is and I felt like oh what is this? I'm not depressed. I have the like I have a really nice like a new apartment in Stockholm and a really awesome job and uh, but then when I started to read like the description of depression and like yeah but the first paragraph it sounds actually I can relate it's... to that <laughs> and then the second paragraph and like I read the whole article and like damn this is this is what I'm feeling mm-hmm. so so then I Yeah, I started, I went to the doctor and they diagnosed me and, and then I realized, well, I don't know how much I realized back then. It was, it was so relieving to get the diagnosis because then I could actually know what to work with. Mm -hmm. And, and now like later I've been, I've been trying to be really open about this and talk about it, even though it might be a bit like, uh, what do you call it? A stigma around it. So everyone who's been through it, try, I hope, try to talk about it because then it's easier for other people to see it. Uh, but then, yeah, I, I left ILP anyways. And, um, and I started to do, I started to like as, as a substitute teacher at a high school, mm-hmm. a, a media high school, because that's something I've always had in the back of my mind because I've, I like teaching. I've lectured throughout my career. I've been like, I've gone, gone back to my old VFX school, 3D school lecturing and went to different different schools talking so i've been thinking maybe i should become a teacher but do i want to study for five years to decide if i want to be a teacher Mm -hmm. no maybe i can just try to be a substitute teacher somewhere where they need someone so so i checked there were two media high schools so i I was thinking yeah i know like the media thing Uh, so maybe i could can get in there and try it out and see how it is. And then, uh, then I can do a difference in the world instead of doing stupid Hollywood movies. I can <laughs> actually work with kids. And so, so I went there for, to one, one high school. They, they replied back when I, I sent an, sent an email to them. They replied back. Yeah, we have an open position. Can you come like tomorrow? And I went <laughs> for a meeting and then, yeah, can you have a class on Monday? And I was like, oh shit. That was quick. Yeah. Yeah. They were like someone was just had just gotten sick and had to be away for for a few months and so so I actually got to work half time as a substitute teacher there mm. and uh, realizing how hard it was, I realized how much like it was so rewarding to work with like teens, but it was also so difficult and it took so much energy i felt i can even if i work 100 percent, even i just can paid for half time even if mm-hmm. i work 100 percent, that's not going to be enough because there's i could do more for this person to help help him or her and i can do more for that that person or i can like adjust my my like teaching style to suit that individual better so it was really, it was a really nice experience. And I realized, yeah, I really like to, to work with people in this way, but mm-hmm. in a high school where some people are really not motivated and you have to try to lift everyone that, that wasn't right for me, 
but during that time, I also went to therapy and I like talked through a lot of stuff with the therapist. And then I left and I had a, got a, got a like temporary employment at, the, at an ad agency as a like producer of some sort, a creative producer for a few months. So I got to see that and try that. And during this time, I, I got to like focus a lot on myself and my, I get to know myself because I've been so focused on my work. Mm -hmm. uh, so during, like I was away from ILP for maybe one and a half year or something. And then I went there for a party and I met there. They had a new boss for the HR team. And she was talking to me like, yeah, well, why did you leave? And what happened? And people seem to like you around here. And, and I told her my story and told her about my depression and how I'm working with myself now. And like, yeah, I do a lot of journaling to figure out what I'm, how my motiva motivation works. And so a bit later, they contacted me and said, yeah, we have this new position that we think would suit you. Um, and that's like an artist manager role. And that sounded like, yeah, I could use all my experience working in the industry and I can use my experience from going through depression and working with myself. So, so I accepted that and that was really scary because they didn't have anyone in that role before. So I was like trying to, to figure out what to do. And that was a lot about performance management, doing performance reviews and yeah, try to like lift people, have help people develop in the way they wanted and have check-ins and like coaching sessions with people. So I, I was doing that for three years uh, while I also got my first kid uh, as a side note, which makes it difficult to, to have a full-time job. Uh, so, so then I left after three years after being on parental leave for a while, I, I got to think about everything. And during those three years, I also started to itch to get back to being creative again. I felt like, oh, I really miss working. And at night I started to learn Houdini, like another software that was the new, the cool new thing. Mm -hmm. So then finally I decided it's really hard to have a full-time job with a kid. I want to be more creative again. Maybe I can start freelancing again. Mm -hmm. And at that point I've in my, in my role there, I was also recruiting. So I built like a huge network of artists, uh, just like connections on LinkedIn and people I've talked to, I've interviewed people and I've and hired people like brought in freelancers. So then I, when I finally decided to leave, I had a much bigger network mm -hmm. and I had I also had the like motivation to get back to it and be really hands-on. I wanted to learn again. And um, yeah, so that's how I, I started freelancing the third yeah. time. That's interesting. Maybe the, I yeah, where I am now. didn't expect such a background. And just coming back to that position, since you stayed there for quite a while, for three years, as you said, did it then meet kind of your expectations or aspirations at that time that you were working with people, helping them, but at the same time, utilizing your skills as an artist. Yes. Yeah, for sure. And it was, that was also really rewarding to see like so, some people we brought in as juniors or interns, and then they got hired and to see them develop and like getting it into a mid position and then maybe becoming a senior or a lead, starting to lead a, a team of a few artists. That was super rewarding. And, but most of all, I think it was because I worked with so, so many great people that like my, my boss in the HR team, she was so, so inspiring. And she really pushed me to like, go to new, like try new, new things, have difficult mm -hmm. conversations, like having to fire someone, uh, that was, was a first, first for yeah. me. It must be but hard I felt I had to yeah, share bad really news. difficult. But uh, but with the support I had, 
it felt doable. And then mm-hmm. when you actually managed to do something like that and you made it in a humane way and it felt like, yeah, we connected still, I made this person understand why it didn't work. And then it wasn't such a terrible experience after all. And I, I grew a lot as a person and I worked a lot with a, a great supervisor, uh, like the VFX supervisor and coaching a lot of people. So I, I, I had these coaching sessions. But most of them were together with some senior, like a supervisor or a senior artist who could coach this, a junior or coach someone going into a lead leadership position. Mm -hmm. And during those years, I learned so much and I felt like, wow, if I knew this like 10 years ago, when I was a junior mid artist, then my, my career would have been like so different. And Mm -hmm. I would have felt so different. So I learned so much during that time and in, in a completely new like area, it wasn't technical how to do stuff in, in like 3d animation, visual effects. It was people, people stuff. Mm -hmm. And that, that's also something that I felt when I left, like I was so busy in, in my role and I didn't have time to. Like I felt I wanted to do, do like a lead handbook. How do you become a new lead? If you start as an artist, when you first get to have a few people under you that you like manage, how do you do that? For example, uh, but I never had time because it was always like, okay, we need to recruit a lot of people. Okay. You can help out with that. Um, or yeah, we need to put out this fire in this team. Can you help like solve a conflict? Mm -hmm. So when I left and started freelancing again, it was also with the intention of, I need to do something with, with these soft skills that I've learned and this new interest I had for, for this, like, yeah, personal development. Uh, So when I left and started freelancing again, it was also, yeah, that's when I decided to start a podcast about exactly these subjects. So I got to do a bit of both because I didn't want to. It felt so like I didn't, I don't want to give up this amazing position where I get to work with awesome people and I learn so much, mm-hmm. but I still want to be creative. I can't just go back to being an artist again, because then I, w- I will miss all those meetings with, with really like senior supervisors. And so what should I do? Let's go work on. So now, now I do a lot of like simple simple projects, like a lot of pack shots, spinning beer cans and bottles and yeah, some smaller VFX work. Yeah. But I also get to talk to supervisors working on Hollywood movies in my podcast. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, uh, that's awesome. And you said before that with all the knowledge you were thinking about writing it down or, uh, you know, writing some kind of a book or something. So did you actually do something like that even after you left? That's, uh, that's, uh, something I'm, I've started to do. Mm. So I'm working, I'm still trying to figure out how to, to like collect it in a good way. Should I do a website? Should I release an actual book or what, what should the format be? Should I just do lectures? Um, I do a bit, a bit of that in my podcast, just me talking about different subjects. But I think, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go on parental leave again in a, in a <laughs> few months. So I have, then I have maybe five months where I'm going to be away from work and maybe stuff will <laughs> start to crystallize yeah. when I'm away. And it uh, actually, it sounds like a great idea and all the ideas that you said now, whether, I don't know, ebook, physical book, lectures or something. Um, I think if, if you think it through, come up with a smart way, how to market it, how to, how to share it. I think it sounds like amazing idea. So I hope that since you shared it publicly now, it will hold you accountable and we will see something in a few yeah. months. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. And also I would just come back to the topic we discussed before about, um, depression and mental health issues. Um. Are there maybe some tips or advice how to maybe prevent it or make sure that it doesn't happen? And then once 
someone is going through it, you know, how to deal with it. And from someone like you who has experience, what would you advise people? Yeah, this is, uh, this is a great question because yeah, I'm, I'm really passionate about this and it's not a lot of times where you get to, to talk about it. And now I think it's I also it, I try to not like sneak to... it in when I talk to students. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just going to say that I think it's also uh, something that maybe not everyone feels comfortable talking about and sharing their experience. So if you yeah. do so, I appreciate it. Yeah, I think what I, if I look back and see how I, like the first maybe eight years of my career of, yeah, in the beginnings, I was just doing what I felt was fun. I was just, oh, this is awesome. I'm going to try this new software or oh, I want to try this. I wasn't thinking and planning like, yeah, but I want to get there. How should I, how should I get there? What do I need to learn and then force myself to like yeah, work on this skill? And then everything was fine. I was really happy. I laughed a lot and had a great time. But then over the years, I started to like focus on yeah, when we had the company, how should we be more successful at the company? And more about status, like I got to work at ILP, work at like one of the coolest companies in, in the industry and work on the cool projects. But is that really what makes me happy? When I've like thought about it later and I come up, like realized maybe that doesn't suit me. Maybe my motivation is to work with a tight team or like a small, small group of friends and be able to just have fun and joke around and like work on, like it doesn't have, like the work doesn't really matter as long as we do something that is fun. Like what I do now, spinning beer cans, I can <laughs> really find passion in trying to make the, like the small water drops, the condensation on the bottle look nice so like i try to improve that every every time i do a new pack shot so it doesn't have to be like this sexy sexy project and i think realizing this that what what actually motivates me what what do i enjoy doing that is something really important and something i talk a lot about with my students the vfx students that okay try to analyze yourself in what projects do you do you enjoy it the most? Do you like it in a, like a big, big project or small project or uh, like being motivated by, by status can be a really powerful driver to actually get you somewhere, uh, get you off your ass. But if you think about, is this really what motivates me? Then you might figure out, yeah, it is. And that's, that's awesome. Then, you know, then you should chase that. But if you think about it and, but no, that's not actually me. I'm trying to chase someone else's dream. Then I think that's where I got wrong. Yeah. And, and I realized this, like looking back, like I have this, this example I realized when I was going in, in therapy, I had this revelation. I was like, what the fuck? I got it all wrong because I, I was thinking, if I get good at something, then it's going to be fun. So I need to like work really hard so mm -hmm. I can become good at it. Like I like playing guitar. And at one point, like in high school, I played a lot. I became really good. It was super fun. But then I realized, but it was fun from the start, even when I was just getting into it and I, I enjoyed it. And that's why I became good. But now I was like working really hard so I could become good at something so it would become fun. Mm -hmm. So I like turned it all around. The motivation, I should follow my motivation instead of like follow, like think if I just become this successful if, or if I just become this good at this, then it's going to be fun. No, follow what is fun and you're going to become good at that. And then that can be your like livelihood. Mm -hmm. So, so when I was starting out, yeah, I didn't know that you can work in movies and commercials in, in this, this way, but I just did it. I was naive. 
I was like, oh yeah, sure. I can try to learn that software. And, and then it just happened. Mm -hmm. And it felt like, it felt like I was really lucky. And, but when I look back, it wasn't, it was just, I was taking all the opportunities that I saw. Oh, this looks fun. Let's try that. Oh, I overheard that, that conversation with where my, my classmate got interviewed. Oh, maybe I should apply to them. Yeah, let's do it. And then when I like got older and I started to think about, yeah, but maybe I need to get more, like maybe I should work on cooler projects. Maybe we started working at ILP was a good, good thing. Like, remember when I told you about this friend who's, who said, maybe you should work at ILP so you can work with really talented people and learn a lot. Mm -hmm. That was what she said, because she probably saw that that would motivate me. But I, when I worst worked there, I thought it's the cool projects that motivate me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I if I just would have reframed it while I was there, maybe I would still be there as an artist mm -hmm. if I could just focus on yeah, I'm learning these awesome new tools, or I'm get, becoming really good at this, and it's so much fun. And maybe I should try this because I like that. Uh, but instead, I was focusing on the wrong wrong things. Mm -hmm. So th this is something that I really think, yeah, that's something I, I wish the, the next generation can be a bit more aware of, like their self, self knowledge to know themselves better mm -hmm. and do some, some introspections. I actually get my students to, to think about these things. What, what actually motivates me and um, when they're going out applying for internships and stuff like that, so they know where they should should apply so i think that's a, a big thing and i think that's because i yeah i've always been an, a nerd i've been really focused on like doing stuff never never think, thinking about my inside what's going on inside of me but when i started to do, do that a whole new world opened up and mm -hmm. uh, i like i learned so much but then it was a bit too late. I've gone really far down this like bad spiral going into a depression. Mm -hmm. So now I feel I have a really long way to climb back, uh, yeah. but I'm working on it. And ha having kids really helps. Of course, they make you really frustrated sometimes, but <laughs> you also laugh a lot, mm -hmm. which I, I didn't do before getting kids because I've yeah, I had been on that yeah, downward yeah, yeah. spiral. For I a feel long like time. I feel like listening to what you are saying that I could definitely see some examples from my own life and my own career as well. So I found it relatable, and I definitely hope that it will help uh, people to realize these things because it's uh, very important. And I think that many people probably go through this stuff, but maybe don't have a courage to talk about it or don't have anyone to, to uh, discuss it with. Um, yeah. So it's great. There is someone who's speaking about it and are, yeah. do you do some, still some kind of coaching or helping people when they need? Not, not on a, like a structured, structured way. Mm -hmm. uh, I have my, my students that I, that I teach and I'm there and before they go out on their internships, I, I've been sitting down one on one with them and talking about, uh, yeah, about these things or like what motivates you, where mm -hmm. do you think you would fit in? Uh, and then in some cases, people bring up these, like, yeah, I'm struggling with this. And so then I feel like, oh, this is, this is really important. Let's just talk about this for an hour. Uh, even though the next student is waiting, but yeah, <laughs> this is like life, life or death could, could be in some cases, uh, mm -hmm. if you're dramatic. So I, I, I try to do it when I have, when I see the opportunity mm -hmm. and it's also something I've been thinking about. Uh, like I, in my podcast, I interviewed someone who's been in VFX for a long time that later became a coach, uh, Deborah Coleman. And, and uh, she, she, yeah, she inspired me to, maybe I should, should actually take a, a coaching class, learn how to do that. And maybe I can do that as a, like the fourth, fourth thing I have going. 
not enough uh, <laughs> in your life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I also feel like just talking to people in the in the podcast, interviewing people, then you get a bit of bit of the, this as well because a lot of what mm. when I talk to someone like it's VFX supervisor, a lot of what we talk about is like the mental things. How do you motivate your team and how do you like how do you deal with your inner demons and stuff mm -hmm. like that? Yeah, and it's good to hear that even people successful like this or people who are way higher on a ladder than you are experience these things and uh, you know think about this and have issues like you do so it's very helpful and helps you to to relate so it's uh, great yeah and as we yeah. discussed the podcast a few times uh, feel free to promote it uh, tell us more about the podcast yeah so the the podcast is called uh, vfx talks and it's about leadership and development in the vfx industry so it's very narrow so i have <laughs> just a few potential listeners <laughs> <laughs> but i feel like this is i couldn't find anything any other source talking about these subjects yeah. so when i was an artist manager i tried to find like how do you do this how do you deal with these kinds of situations how do you become a lead for example but i couldn't find any proper resources for it so that's why i felt like okay this is my niche this is where i'm i know the vfx part i try to learn the leadership and mentoring part and uh, what i try to do like there are there are a lot of vfx podcasts talking about okay how did you do this effect in this movie or talking about people's career but i try to be very focused like okay what's your background get that out of out of the way and then okay when you first became a supervisor was what was your struggles how did you overcome them mm -hmm. what is your like what advice would you give to someone getting into the industry now or so i i've talked to interview i've interviewed recruiters how do you what's the best way to to apply to a company how should you structure your cv or do you need the cv or is it just sending in the, your best work yeah so i've tried to be really actionable and like yeah not focus too much on not yeah, being inspiring as as this this show is more about like talking about the journey and and being inspiring but i try to be m much more like getting yeah. down to f like yeah from a different or... angle yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and obviously it's uh not uh, easy but are there perhaps some key lessons or key takeaways that you can share from your podcast something that uh, is important and maybe even to lure people to listen to your show i think the the biggest takeaway for me is that i was so so afraid of starting it and i felt like an imposter who am i to to do this and what do i know and also putting it out there i felt really afraid to put out my own opinions and like what what will people think about me but when i finally decided okay i'm just gonna do it and i think i took this advice from tim ferris he said mm -hmm. that just do it do six episodes and then then uh you like force yourself to do six episodes then you're gonna see how how it is and then you're probably gonna continue because then you realize it's actually fun mm. and, and what I realized is that the response is so great. Like I don't, I don't have that many listeners, like, I don't know, a thousand per episode if I'm lucky, but I get a lot of people just sending emails on LinkedIn saying, oh, I listened to your, your uh, podcast and like, thank you for, I really needed that or you're my workout buddy now. <laughs> I listen to your your show when I'm at the gym, and and people like in in the the cool companies, like oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a supervisor at this company or I'm a lead at this company, and I've shared your episode with my team, and then it's like wow, maybe maybe I have something to offer, mm. even though I feel as an imposter still. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that. The key takeaway there is to like 
if there is something that you feel you want to get out, like I felt I need to to do something with this, mm -hmm. then there's probably a need for it. There's some probably someone who wants to to yeah. listen to it, mm -hmm. and also this like trying to not think about trying to not look at how many listeners I get, uh, but actually see the quality of the the listeners. If the people are really invested and they actually take the time to write to me, then that's actually more important than if I would have many more listeners and no one would comment or like yeah. thank me. That like Then you don't know who they are. Now it's much mm -hmm. more personal. And I think that is really... That's really motivating. So, I agree. Yeah. And a little side note uh, that your podcast was, I told you before, but it was one of the inspirations for me when I was starting as well. Because since I was working in VFX company, your podcast is VFX related. And um, I don't know how I found it, but um, I listened to it and it was one of the inspirations. So uh, thank you as well. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's awesome. It's I'm super happy to to hear that. And yeah, I would also like to ask you or discuss uh, some projects that you worked on because we didn't really discuss what you worked on. So can you maybe uh, pick some that for some reason maybe you enjoyed, were unique, were challenging, or just interesting to share? Yeah. So one recent project is. Uh... A crazy one. I did a, a drone show. I animated drones for Louis Vuitton. Uh, they had a fashion show in Hong Kong before Christmas. And I got asked by this random guy, like, okay, can you jump on this project? It's just one week and uh, we'll try to figure it out. And I felt, oh, this is, a, this is scary, <laughs> first of all. But it's also pretty cool. It's a nice... Like it's a technical challenge and it's an animation challenge. Okay, I shouldn't be so boring and just say no. So so I said yes and started doing it. And in like a project like that, there are usually a lot of people involved. So in this case, there were many layers. Like there was this, yeah, my my client who got hired by one agency or studio who got hired by an agency who worked <laughs> for Louis Vuitton mm -hmm. uh, and during the project like the guy I worked with he was he's really young and really talented super nice guy but he couldn't really say no to the client because of course this is pretty pretty important client so when they come with changes uh, he couldn't push back and say no we don't have time for that and I, I didn't want to be so boring and push back. Uh, and I felt, yeah, but we can probably make it. But then that continued on and like, okay, we're closing on. We have to deliver something. But then we were still like, still getting changes. And in the end, I, like, we worked day, day and night and uh, I started getting panic attacks and it was horrible and actually i couldn't finish it i made everything but i couldn't like sew it all together so he managed to my my client managed to find another one who could another guy who could actually stitch it together in the end uh, but it was really cool to see like the live stream from hong kong when a thousand drones were flying mm. in my like the the ways i've animated them and seeing um Farrell Williams walk True. on the on the runway and like looking up at the drones that I animated here in Stockholm. That was a mm. bit surreal. So was uh, it in the it, end beautiful, perfect, as as if uh, it was smooth uh, production? It wasn't a smooth production, but uh, the result, if you see, I mean, like, yeah. yeah, we had one week and mm -hmm. we had to figure out how to animate drones. How do you do that? And they shouldn't fly too close to each other. So we had like. Yeah, we have to animate this like crashing wave, but the drones have to be like 1.6 meters apart and they can't move faster than this in like in the horizontal axis and or faster than this in y axis and so there were a lot of technical challenges mm. and uh, I think we managed to solve 
everything in those yep. in the limits of yeah the, the project it was a really i guess a really successful project mm. yeah. but i wish i wish to do something like that again but with more time and yeah. more like, less pressure yeah, to, yeah exactly mm -hmm. uh, yeah. but that that was a really interesting one because that was so many like a completely new thing like i know how to animate points in houdini that was mm -hmm. what we did basically just animating points and tell them what color and how to like light up and dim down but then having all these like physical limitations they can't crush into each other and that was a an interesting new challenge that you mm -hmm. never have to think about in like when you just work digitally with vfx or yeah so that was uh, that was an interesting one and i i learned that okay i need to be able to put my foot down when i think okay i'm not going to be able to deliver anything if we don't say no to this feedback now that mm -hmm. we will miss the deadline so yeah there are specific maybe type of projects or specific uh i don't know area that you enjoy doing the most yeah what i what i enjoy the most now is like small visual effects projects. So that is when you maybe have something filmed. Like I have one, one project where I, uh, I did for a commercial, they, they had filmed inside a house and the ceiling was supposed to crack. So there's this guy who like looks up and in the ceiling. And so I had to do like a camera track and then do a crack in the ceiling and, um, to match all the lighting and everything and then simulate like pieces of like what do you call it? drywall plaster mm -hmm. falling down and dust and stuff like that and then comp it all together if you're in the vfx lingo <laughs> uh, so that that is what i really enjoy now doing all of those steps like if you're in a big company there's usually one guy doing the camera tracking just matching the camera movement exactly and then yeah. one other guy who does the like modeling of the crack and one guy is doing the simulation mm -hmm. but i i really like these small projects where i get to do all of those steps yeah uh, so it's not like a fancy hollywood crack but it's a, it works in the commercial it's mm. there are like three three different shots and so that, that is something i really really must enjoy. be great for your portfolio because then you can say i did everything because uh, yeah. often when people want to put it into their portfolio, it's not as easy because plenty of people work on it and uh, it's a bit different. So, yeah. yeah. Um, where can people see your portfolio or even your work? Do you, uh, you can promote yourself? Yeah, I I think the the most what I what I want to get out there is the the podcast, and that is called VFX Talks, and you can find it like wherever you get your podcast. You can go to vfxtalks.com. Uh, if you want to see my very not updated portfolio, you can go to <laughs> alfredlindahl.com um, or just Google my name. Uh, but that's not, that's what I do to, to make money and <laughs> yeah, yeah, explore the creative side a bit, but not. It's the pod, the podcast that I'm most like mm -hmm. trying yeah. to get out there, but still, yeah, I have two kids now. I don't have a lot of time for the podcast, so it's very like sporadic, mm -hmm. but, uh, hopefully if people start to pressure me after this, <laughs> I will have to put in the time for it. Yeah. I will make sure to add uh, links to the show notes and, um, since you you are juggling so many things so do you want to also say something about your time management it must be quite hard so uh you know prioritizing stuff making sure that you don't go crazy and uh you know how how do you deal yeah. with it if you want to boost your online presence check out our digital marketing agency called trailblazed you can also enroll in our skillshare course called the 10 tips on how to succeed in your creative career which was inspired by the podcast. Lastly, make sure to subscribe to our weekly newsletter called Creative Spotlight to stay up to date with the show and more. Links are in the show notes. Thanks. Yeah, that that's a really hard one because now I feel like there's no 
there's no air in my system. I like, I go up, br- bring up the two kids and give them breakfast, take one of them to preschool uh, because my girlfriend is up breastfeeding at night. So it's hard for her to, like she needs a few few hours or one hour to at least sleep a bit. Mm-hmm. Or, and then I'm just off to work and then I can work for maybe six hours and then I have to go home and cook or, and then put one of them to bed. I go out with a stroller, make one of them fall asleep. And then, then you're so tired to like, I can't really work on, on that much afterwards. So that's something I really struggle with now. And I think that is also something that I've, I've learned over the years that I need to make time for what makes me feel good. So I need to work out pretty regularly. That really helps me like wash away the stress. So, and that's also like alone time. I go to the gym by myself. I just zone into my things and do whatever deadlifts or Mm -hmm. squats, or I go out and run. And, and I also need the like sitting at the cafe, uh, journaling. So sometimes in the mornings, even though I feel I'm too stressed to like, I don't have time for this, but if I go to a cafe, sit down, have a cup of tea or whatever, and write down, okay, what do I actually have to do today? Then I can structure everything, make it like, okay, this is actually the priority. This I'm worried for no reason, because this isn't like, this doesn't have to be done today. I can do that tomorrow. And when I do that, when I manage to like force myself to go to the gym after the kids have fallen asleep, for example, and I take the time to do some journaling in the morning, then I, I know I feel better mm-hmm. than if I just, like if I'm so stressed that I don't make time for that, then I'm just going to be more stressed. Yep. So for me, that, that is the, the key. And also understanding like when I talk to my partner, my, my girlfriend saying, okay, okay, I really need to go to the gym. That is going to help her in the end. It's not that I'm, I'm not leaving her to take care of the kids just because I want to go have fun, but it's because I want to stay sane. I'm going to yep. be a worse dad and worse partner if I don't get that hour in the gym. Mm-hmm. So I think understanding that I need that, I Otherwise, everything else is going to fall apart and I'm going to be depressed. And yeah, like then I won't be able to perform at work and I will be, I will scream at the kids. Mm -hmm. So that's the big, the big lesson there. I understand myself. I understand that and I can relate to it. It's uh, like when you go to gym, it's not just that you want to, but it helps you and it kind of affects the rest of the day, your mood and just um, yeah. helps you to to deal with everything just in a different way yeah and and also little things like uh, like making your bed in the morning now my girlfriend is usually <laughs> sleeping while i <laughs> while i uh, get up but if you do that and you get your small win like okay i did something then <laughs> you're on the yeah the right uh, right path start of the so, day especially yeah, yeah. mhm yeah. And also knowing when you work the best. So I, I work best in the morning and now it's really hard for me to, because I have to bring the kids up, and take them out of bed and make the oldest ready for preschool. And, but I'm, I'm looking forward to when I can get out of bed, just go to a cafe, structure my day, go to work, do the most difficult things first, like at seven in the morning Mm -hmm. Uh, so i know that's when i work the best that's how like i'm i'm wired but then also to what i'm trying to to think about what a friend of mine his his dad told him like there's always there's time for that like okay i want to do this i want to do that yeah you can there's time to to do that later you don't have to I used to have a motorcycle and do crazy motorcycle adv- adventures, riding around Iceland, and like gravel deserts. And, mm-hmm. and when I got kids, I, I sold my motorcycle 
but I still have my gear down in the basement. And I know that there's going to be time to mm-hmm. pick that up again. So I don't have to <laughs> stress about like, I'm missing all of that. And the same with, with everything. Uh, I'm, it's, it's hard to think about it like, like this, but I, I don't have to do everything at the same time. I can yeah. now, maybe it's more important to focus on the family. Maybe I don't have to develop my business as much. I can just do, do like manage it. And then there's going to be a time when my kids don't want to hang out with me anyways. So then mm-hmm. I can focus on that again. Yeah. And that really, really helps to think about, even though yeah. it's, it's hard to remember. <laughs> no, I understand. I think yeah, it's about uh, priorities. What is uh, the most important now? And uh, as you said, as you said, don't need to rush it, but actually enjoy the moment because then once your kids grow up, it's too late, obviously, and you, you don't get a chance to experience it again. Um, yeah, so Alfred, uh, we spoke a bit longer than I uh, originally said, but since there was a lot to discuss, uh, I didn't want to miss out. But is, if there is something that you would like to share or I forgot to ask you or even to promote anything else, now is your time. So feel free to share what you want. Yeah, I, th- I think there's one one thing that I'm struggling with a lot at the moment that I'm thinking about a lot as I'm like I'm approaching 40 and I'm teaching so I get to see these really talented young people with so much energy and so much time they don't have any kids no obligations and I see them being better than me at some parts of 3D and I feel like oh shit <laughs> I I should really get back at it and I need to develop more and and for example with AI now coming into the VFX industry how should we do or machine learning is probably a better term how I need to like be up to speed with all the new tools so I don't like so I can like comp- continue to be competitive and deliver the best stuff mm-hmm. and that can be really stressful and it is for me, it's like, oh fuck, I need to do all, I need to learn this. I need to learn Unreal, for example, Unreal Engine, because that's something that's really taken over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, then I realize, but is this really what I want to do? Is this, uh, and should I, should I do all of that myself? Or maybe I can actually, I'm planning to next year bring in an intern. Hmm. And maybe hire someone. Mm-hmm. So if I have a junior who is really motivated and keeps up with all of that, just because they think it's fun, then that's probably a better way of doing it than for me to, as I said before, like forcing myself to do all of these things. And instead, it's if I focus on, it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And if I focus on what I enjoy and I enjoy the podcast, and maybe that will grow into something instead. So then maybe I want need to do be hands-on doing ai art Mm -hmm. in the in the future Uh, maybe i can have a team of people working with me and i can use all of my like experience and my knowledge and trying to be the best boss and trying to make them develop instead so so this is something that i work like struggling with a lot now and thinking about like why am i not as good at this person Mm. but then realizing but i'm good at all of these other things maybe i should keep doing these other things and not try to like be better at them in all of those other areas so that's something yeah yeah i think it's uh so when it comes to uh that we tend to compare ourselves to other people so i think something that all of us sometimes struggle with because you know social media internet you see someone younger better more successful and everything and just sometimes compare yourself which of course doesn't help you may give you some inspiration but at the same time makes you feel like you haven't achieved anything so it was a good a good point as well yeah i think um, i think that's it i think we've covered a lot of really really interesting things and i (laughs) I can talk talk a lot when i when i'm getting started (laughs) it uh, no it was a great chat uh uh, learned a lot, a lot of uh, in, insightful, insightful information, 
uh, for me, it was great to speak with you because as I said, you are one of my inspirations when I was starting and um, I will be following your journey, excited to, uh, when you deliver on what you promised on this show and uh, definitely in the future, always will be open to do part, uh, part two of our discussion. Yeah, sounds awesome. Thank you so much for having me. It's now my... I, I feel like you've you've been so much more you've delivered delivered so so many more episodes on your podcast and <laughs> all this nice packaging that I don't have. And now I feel like oh damn it, I need to step up my uh, game. But... <laughs> uh, if if anything, I just hope it will be inspiration for you and uh, hopefully some motivation. Yeah. So thank you, Alfred. That's been great. We'll stay in touch and wish you good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a five-star review on your favorite podcast app, get in touch to provide your feedback, or share any ideas for future guests. Thank you, and see you soon.